prohibitive cost that the mandate in H.R. 1195 would impose on America's hospitals, particularly on those that provide care in rural and underserved areas, could strain scarce resources and jeopardize patient care. These mandates would burden health care providers that are struggling to maintain services during the most deadly public health emergency in 100 years, end quote. Uh, Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the American Hospital Association letter be included in the record. Without objection. Thank you. And Madam Speaker, you know, we're hearing from the people who are on the front lines, and we've said we want to protect the people on the front lines. Well, let's listen to the people on the front lines. And with that, I reserve. Reserves, the gentleman from Connecticut is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Really quick, on page 11 of the bill, it specifically states that the plans proposed to be adopted by OSHA would be, quote, tailored and specific to conditions and hazard for the covered facility or the covered service, including spa patient-specific risk factors and risk factors specific to each work area or unit. That is not one size fits all. And with that, I now yield to, uh, again, a member who can really bring very powerful personal experience uh, to this issue, uh, the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Garcia. And how much time? For uh, one minute? Minute, minute and a half? Uh, two minutes. The gentlewoman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to um, the, the Congressman. I am here today to express my support for this very important piece of legislation. This is simple, it's much needed, and it's just a common sense bill. And for my friends across the aisle who think that this is some intellectual exercise that we're trying to find some mandate or that we need to listen to the front lines, well, I'm here to tell you what happens in the front lines. Well, it was not yesterday. It was when I was a social worker, a geriatric social worker. We had received a report of a street child taking care of a senior, and they were concerned about the senior and the street child. I went to the door to make an assessment. I knocked on the door and I was greeted by a Saturday night special right in my face as a social worker, just trying to do my job. And she kept saying, you ain't gonna take my baby, you ain't gonna take my baby. And I was scared, scared and scared, never having faced a gun to my face. Madam Speaker, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about because you've probably had similar experience. But I was a social worker just trying to make an assessment to see if this senior needed help at home. I had nothing to do with trying to take her child away, but she confused me for a child welfare worker. This is what can happen. It's happened to me. It happens today. And as Representative Haley pointed out, it happened at 2 a.m. this morning not to a social worker, a postal uh, a FedEx worker. We must do something to make sure that we can protect workers and that we end workplace violence. This is a small step. It's not an intellectual exercise. It's real. I'm speaking personally, and I'm here to stand with social workers across America to make sure that we do everything we can to make, say, make their job workplace safe and that everyone is protected. Thank you, ma'am, and I yield back. And from Connecticut Reserves, the gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker, I reserve. The gentlewoman reserves, the gentleman from Connecticut is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's now my honor to yield one minute to the gentlelady from Illinois, uh, Ms. Schakowsky. The gentlewoman from Illinois is recognized for one minute. Thank you. Workplace violence has reached epidemic levels and is the third greatest cause of job death right now. Nurses, medical assistants, emergency responders, and social workers face some of the greatest threats, suffering more than 72% of all workplace um, assaults. And women suffer two out of every three uh, serious workplace violence incidents. This is unacceptable. We need to protect workers and require employers to put in place effective workplace violence prevention plans. It's simple. Make a plan. 
We need to protect our health care and social service workers who have done so much for us during the pandemic to care for us, and now we need to care for them. We need H.R. 1195 now. Let's come together and get it done. And I would ask uh, unanimous consent to put into the record a, um, it's a uh, editorial column from uh, Bonnie Castillo and also a letter from the AFL-CIO. And the I gentle, know that. Without objection, the gentlewoman's time has expired. The gentleman from Connecticut reserves. The gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. May I inquire as to how much time is remaining? The gentlewoman from North Carolina has 11 minutes and three quarters. The gentleman from Connecticut has 11 minutes and one quarter. Madam Speaker, I'll reserve. The gentlewoman from North Carolina reserves. The gentleman from Connecticut is recognized. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. It's now my uh, privilege to yield one minute to the gentlelady from Minnesota, Ms. Craig. The gentlewoman from Minnesota is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just over two months ago, a man walked into an Alina Health Clinic in Buffalo, Minnesota and opened fire, killing one employee and injuring four others. On that tragic day, nurses, doctors, social workers, and others were reportedly targeted because of their professions. Tragically, this senseless and horrific act of violence is representative of a broader trend in our society. Today, members of the healthcare workforce are five times as likely to suffer a workplace injury than Americans in other professions. Madam Speaker, what in the hell are we doing in Congress if we're not gonna stand up and do anything for our healthcare heroes and those workers? My colleagues who vote against this bill are ignoring the pleas of the EMTs and the emergency workers and all of those folks who have been on the front lines of this healthcare pandemic. Happy to yield the lady 15, yeah, 15 seconds. Additional 15 seconds. It is our responsibility to step forward and help protect our workers. It is beyond the pale to put our heads in the sand as members of Congress and say, there is nothing that we can do. What the hell are we doing here if we do that? And I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The gentleman from Connecticut reserves. The gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we grieve for anyone who is killed violently in this country under any circumstances. Again, that is not a partisan issue. Madam Speaker, the healthcare industry is currently in the midst of responding to a once in a century pandemic and has rightly prioritized significant resources to caring for patients and keeping its employees safe from COVID-19. Forcing OSHA to issue an interim final standard on workplace violence within one year as H.R. 1195 requires, will have a devastating impact on the healthcare industry during the COVID-19 pandemic. Last thing our healthcare providers need during this unprecedented public health crisis are more costly mandates from Washington that will strain resources and personnel and jeopardize patient care. Moreover, the Biden administration is expected soon to impose new employer mandates in the form of an OSHA emergency temporary standard for COVID-19 and eventually a permanent infectious disease rule, which will have a significant impact on the healthcare industry. At a time when healthcare facilities are experiencing massive revenue losses and have invested significant resources into responding to COVID-19, the issuance of two new regulations from Washington, potentially within months of each other, will be devastating. Our nation's healthcare providers have responded admirably to the pandemic and are doing heroic work to keep Americans safe and healthy. The House should reject this ill-timed and ill-advised legislation that will inhibit this work and burden the healthcare industry at exactly the wrong time. With that, I reserve. 
gentlewoman reserves the gentleman from connecticut is recognized thank you uh, madam speaker again just to clarify the april 9th cbo report that came out which again cited the the, the numbers which were cited accurately by uh, the opposition is a number that is spread out over 200,000 facilities across the country again if you do the math we're talking about nine thousand dollars per facility per year i mean ask yourself whether or not that figure you know, weighing the balance of what we're we're trying to um, protect here, which is people's health and lives, is worth it. I, I think most people, you know, would apply common sense to that and realize that, um, you know, that's that's not going to drive healthcare costs through the roof. And in fact, it's going to protect workers and protect them from absenteeism. It's going to protect you know, these institutions from high workers' compensation costs. I mean, it's just common sense. Uh, here to to join us again today, and I thank her. Uh, Presence here is uh, uh, the gentlelady from uh, Michigan, Ms. Talib. I yield two minutes. The gentlewoman from Michigan is recognized for two minutes. Thank you so much. Everyone, everyone should feel safe at work. They should be safe at work. I want to give testimony to Kenya, who's a 49 year old certified nursing assistant. I want to bring her words here in the Congress to understand what we're trying to do, who we're trying to protect. She said, quote, you don't know if you're going to take the virus home to your family or not. I have two children, 16 and 18, and a one-year-old grandbaby that I worry about all the time. I have a designated place where I take my uniform off and my shoes off to keep my family safe. I come in, I go directly to the basement where I already have a change of clothes, strip all my clothes off, put all of my clothes directly into the washing machine. Then there's my mom. I'm her only child now. So that's a big scare because who's going to take care of her? It's very scary for my family. They don't want me to go back to work, but I have to go to work because I have to be able to take care of my family. And I tell them my residents need me. These are the human stories behind the fact that people right now are asking us, United States Congress, to pass legislation that is long overdue to protections for workers in some of the most high stress, least appreciated positions in our communities. These workers are a front line, they, a front, on the front lines day in, day out, serving vulnerable groups and face rates of workplace violence out of five times the rate of workers in other communities. And she was expressing in here just the number of the stress of it and on top of that workplace violence. And I want for the submit for the record, Madam Speaker, if I may, uh, a letter of support from SEIU on behalf of the over 1 million healthcare and social service workers across our country. These are protections that should have been long been in place and enforced. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation and when passed and signed into law, I urge OSHA to immediately work for issue the standards necessary to protect these workers. I give that story because on top- Time has expired. So the gentleman from Connecticut oh, seek recognition. Uh, yield additional 30 seconds? Yeah. I get, additional 30 I get seconds that, is yielded. I give that story of Kenya that lives in Livonia, Michigan, because on top of all of that, she was dealing with obviously the number of lack of protections in the workplace. And again, these are people that take care of our loved ones, take care of our sick, take care of those that are mentally ill, that need assistance, that their family members are not equipped or trained to do. The least we can do, especially during this pandemic, is to offer them more protection and safety in the workplace. I yield. The gentlewoman yields back. The gentleman from Connecticut reserves. The gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I understand from the gentleman from Connecticut that he's prepared to close, and, and I right. am also. One from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, overbearing regulations burden workers and stifle the economy. Preventing workplace violence in healthcare and social services settings is crucial, and we should get this done by allowing OSHA to issue standards through the normal rulemaking process, which brings all experts and parties, including small businesses, to the table. Short-circuiting the process and rushing to a conclusion eliminates valuable technical and scientific input and will lead to unintended consequences which could have a detrimental impact on workplace safety outcomes. 
A bipartisan solution was possible here, but once again, Democrats have kicked it to the curb. I urge a no vote on H.R. 1195, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman yields back. The gentleman from Connecticut is recognized. Th thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, again, I want to thank the gentlelady uh, uh, from North Carolina. And, and here's the good news. Um, when we started this journey on this legislation back in 2013, a number of us requested a GAO report because we had heard, you know, anecdotal evidence about the fact that uh, healthcare workers were experiencing this, you know, really disturbing level of violence that was, um, again, something that people had really never seen before. And GAO took three years, very methodically, as only they do. I mean, they're the gold standard in terms of research. And they brought in all the studies and all the evaluation. And they verified, sadly, that all the statistics that we've talked about here on the floor uh, today, 73% of incidents happen in these two sectors. Um, the fact is, is that they not only verified that, but they showed that those numbers are actually underreporting. Because what's happening out there is that because we don't have any system that people can turn to when they're experiencing this kind of unacceptable behavior, they basically are in a situation where most of the time they just are saying, you know, suck it up, shake, shake it off. That's part of the job. Just move on. Don't, 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 you know, uh, spend any time on that. So, in fact, what GAO told us is that the numbers are, that we're seeing in, in other um, sort of reports underreport. In fact, what's going on uh, out there. Again, we, we took that report, we crafted a legislation, we really did accommodate some of the issues that we've heard talked about on the floor here today about ensuring that there is gonna be an adequate comment period for all stakeholders. I mean, we want that. I mean, we understand that, you know, the hospital association, just like the emergency room docs, just like the nurses, they all should have their opportunity to, to weigh in in terms of what is a, 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 a viable, workable standard. And, but what we don't need is to have OSHA just sort of lapse into its notorious dysfunctional delays in terms of developing a workforce standard. And Mr. Scott ticked off, again, some of the most recent examples. 2017 beryllium took 18 years. Uh, silica dust took 17 years. And, and again, the, the last administration, when they came to the committee, they said, no, we're, we're, we're going to start the process. We're going to begin, you know, uh, a docket in terms of getting uh, rulemaking. And then the first scheduled date was delayed. And then the second scheduled date was delayed again and, and on and on and on. And right now, today, as we stand here in this, in this chamber, there is nothing scheduled right now. And really, when you really boil down where I think the disagreement exists, and I'm, I'm you know, happy to acknowledge that. But I think it's a meaningful distinction, which is that we are going to put this agency on the clock. We're telling them that you know you can you you can, you know follow the procedures, take the the comment, but we're not going to sit back and allow this unacceptable trend to continue unaddressed. You know that agency was created back in the Nixon administration to protect America's workers, and you know what it's your it's and we want you as the as the branch of government that created you to, to, to develop a standard in a reasonable amount of time. And Madam Speaker, I just wanna, this is not unprecedented. Congresses in the past have done this. During the last pandemic, during AIDS, we again saw a bloodborne pathogen that just was totally sweeping hospitals and healthcare institutions all across the country. And we intervened and put a clock on OSHA to develop an, a bloodborne pathogen workforce standard. And that's why today, when you go to the hospitals, people are wearing gloves. They're using disposable needles. All that stuff that we take for granted now, that was OSHA. And actually, it was Congress who told OSHA to develop that standard. So we're in a situation here today in 2021 where, again, we're seeing something out there that, again, I, and I, I want to thank Ms. Fox. I mean, because she's, she's not in denial, that's for sure. I mean, she really as I said, thoughtfully talked about what's, what's driving some of this. But the fact is, now it's time to act. And, and, and again, I want to thank, again, some of the Republican members who came forward, because I think, you know, they, they, it's hard, you know, right now. But they came forward and co-sponsored this bill. And I hope, Madam Speaker, that, you know, the experience, again, the shared experience of the last year that this country went through is something people will think about when they vote um, later today and support this legislation. And with that, I yield back.
Gentleman yields back. All time for debate has expired. Each further amendment printed in Section C of House Report 117-15, not earlier considered as part of an amendments in block pursuant to Section 6 of House Resolution 303, shall be considered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, may be withdrawn by the proponent at any time before the question is put thereon, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. It shall be in order at any time for the chair of the Committee on Education and Labor or his designee to offer amendments and block consisting of further amendments printed in Section C of House Report 117-15, not earlier disposed of. Amendments and blocks shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for 20 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking member of the Committee on Education and Labor on their respective or their respective designees, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. For what purpose does the gentleman from Connecticut seek recognition? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as the designee of the Chairman of the Education and Labor Committee and pursuant to Section 6 of House Resolution 303, I rise to offer amendments on block number one. The clerk shall designate the amendments and block. On block number one, consisting of amendments numbered one, two, three, four, and six, printed in Part C of House Report number 117-15, offered by Mr. Courtney of Connecticut. Pursuant to House Resolution 303, the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney, and the gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Fox, each will control 10 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise in support of an en bloc amendment number one. These five amendments will, one, direct OSHA to prioritize providing technical assistance and advice to employers to promote compliance with during the first year. Two, clarify that nothing in this act will limit existing protections against domestic violence, stalking, or sexual violence. Three, clarify that employers can consult experts when developing their workplace violence prevention plans. Four, provide additional training to workers who interact with survivors of torture, trafficking, and domestic violence. And five, adds Alzheimer's and memory care facilities as facilities covered by this legislation. These amendments make meaningful improvements to the bill, and I urge a yes vote on en bloc number one, and I now yield uh, one minute. 